got here in 2004 on a business trip, and pretty much wound up staying for eight months before I went home the first time. So it's nice to always get back and go down the MG Road. So I can actually twist it off the wall, carry it around in your hand, just whatever buttons you want to do. A very clever device. Um, I also have an Amazon Echo. Uh, we heard about some of those yesterday. We went to the session. Very cool device. I have an Apple TV. Um, got some you know, switches like that. A little Amazon IoT button. So you hit this button and some magic happens in the cloud. I got to figure out how to hack that so it doesn't go to the cloud. Just go to me. But it's like a very cheap little button. A $5 button. Um, and so the question I get from some of my colleagues is, yeah, this home IoT is kind of, but what are you going to use it for? I mean, why should you bother have home automation? I mean, what's interesting about this environment? What is the business case? Why would you bother doing this? And it, it's one of my friends in California who says this to me, and uh, I did a startup with him. And he sort of asked that question. I, my answer is kind of like, well, first of all, there's a high volume. If you get automated houses, you have a high volume application. High volume of devices, that means the device cost goes way down, it gets cheaper and cheaper to do these things. So that's why all these people sort of care about this because it allows you to get the devices down. And I think, for in terms of ease of use, if you can get it to work in your house, you really have tackled ease of use. That you have you know, various people that are not tech that are able to run these sort of things to make them work. If you can figure out how that works, the better advantage in the marketplace. And finally, because we're, we're a nerd, it's kind of fun to play with this. So that's kind of what it is. But I felt it was a bit disingenuous when he talked about why would you want to automate your house this way? Because I pulled out my iPhone at the time and basically said, let me sort of see how many devices you have in your house. He's got 74 things hooked to his network. Every television, every light switch is hooked to his network. He's got 120 cables running around this house hooking things together. And the reason he, how he runs this house, he's got a three hide wide rack in his basement. Yeah, this is not your typical thing. Uh, I don't have room for this in my house. My flat is really tiny. Um, so, uh, but, but by him saying it's not important, well, look what he's doing. Uh, and it is pretty cool to live in his house and do all these magic things. Uh, all right, so I think it is interesting for those reasons. It's kind of fun to work with. Now, because it's interesting, of course, everybody wants a piece of the pie. So you have all these guys saying, I can control your house for you. And of course, you got Amazon Echo, um, really nice device. Uh, I went to the Consumer Electronics Show this year. Uh, lots and lots of devices are hooking into Alexa or have Alexa implementations in there with their Alexa toolkits. But equally as much as there were Google reps running around everywhere saying, oh, by the way, you could, look at this. We can hook this to Google. Look at this. I mean, they're little white uniforms and they were everywhere. They had little. You know, Google stuff around them. So Google basically says, oh, that's pretty cool. Well, I got a better device because mine comes in white. Uh, I also come in some other colors. I'm way cooler than the Amazon colors. Uh, and pretty much they do, a, they do a pretty decent job of that as well. Uh, but they're not the only player. Uh, at one point, Microsoft says, I want to run your house. I'll run it through your Xbox. This becomes your central device. It's kind of fallen out of favor because it's not really programmability of this thing. Uh, they always said, I, I was in there, I could do this, and they kind of never followed up with that. So it became a bit of a non-player. Um, the other guy, of course, Apple says they do this, and Apple's doing a really nice job of it. Next day, you put this little tiny box, it's about yay big, um, put this in there, and by the way, because of the Apple networking stuff, I can sit here in Bangalore on my iPhone and control the lights in my house through my Apple TV. It actually does work. So I can actually do it that way as well. So there are players in this market as well. Uh, interesting enough, uh, Hugh Phillips himself put the little Hue bridge out there, and basically the original bridge allowed people to write their own code and plug their own devices in. And then, of course, the product owner says, well, you, what you really want to do is sell only Phillips devices. We don't want to hook the other guys in there. So they did an update to their software and made it impossible to plug other things into it, which we just basically said as a, an as a company and as geeks, we aren't going to play with you anymore. We quit. They said, Oh, you're not going to play anymore? Well, we'll put it back. Well, it's too late. You know, the guys did it. So basically, they had a chance to be that guy, and they screwed it up because they closed the system. So, but it was a contender at some point. I mean, one of the most fascinating ones I was came out uh, uh, actually the year before at CES, and that is Samsung. They said, your refrigerator can be your hub. And it's incredibly clever because it's got power. It's got all the parts. It's a refrigerator. And they put this gigantic touchscreen right on the door. 
It doesn't take any more space in your house. Now, unfortunately, this thing costs a few thousand dollars. That's your typical refrigerator. Um, but a very cool idea, and it's kind of one of their ideas that says, I'm in there. And by the way, touch screen is probably better than talking to an echo. It's a house size. Thing. So I think they're quite clever in that. They have a new version out this year. I saw that in like 24 as well. But a nice play. But you got, now you're sitting here saying, okay, well, which one do I hook my device to? Which one should I use for my house? Do all of my devices work with all these other variations? The programmers, we know that they have a happy ending. So there's a whole a whole IT, IoT morass at this point. Right? Which one do you hook to? Can you do this or not? Uh, there are articles that were talking about that. Uh, this is one from you know about a year ago now. I'm talking about the API clutter associated with this. Of course, what do we do when we have API clutter? Well, of course, we need to build middleware. So now middleware starts appearing for any of your house. And of course, now there's six of those. So we went from six devices to now 12 different APIs. So I don't think, again, they're not helping us. My solution to this is I don't want to play with that stuff. That world is just crazy. It's going to stay crazy. They're going to be fighting this stuff out. Um, so my idea is I'm going to do some microservices. I want to play with my microservice and architecture. So sort of say, well, let me just fire all of these guys. and Let me just kind of see what I can do myself with some microservices. And why do I pick microservices? Well, a couple of interesting reasons is, first of all, I don't know what I want to do. So I'm kind of in this fuzzy thing. I don't know how I want to run my house, and I don't know what device is coming next, and there's all sorts of uncertainty around there. So I'm kind of in that old graveyard space. And so it gives me some flexibility. And also, because there's very tiny little services, I, if something comes out and changes, I can change that part of the system very easily without necessarily affecting the other part. I like that sort of highly decoupled architecture. Because I don't want to keep rewriting my monolith around my house every time a new version of a device comes out. And I'll sort of layer my functionality on top of that. We'll see some examples of architecture later. So that's why I kind of want to play with microservices like this. Because of that in a certain way. And I want to use asynchronous microservices in particular. By asynchronous microservices, I mean the idea that they really don't even know about each other. That there's a concept of, of very, very loosely coupled services. And we ran a workshop, I think, on Monday this week, you may, you may have attended, where we talked about building asynchronous systems and saw how highly decoupled they can become and how easy it is to write their systems. So one of the things I like to do with asynchronous microservices, first of all, there is not like synchronous. It's kind of not like the Netflix thing where you have RESTful interface and all this stuff. They really are just more like agent-based systems. And they're very tiny, very loosely coupled, easy to deploy. Um, don't have to worry about registration. And they're actually very compatible with the concept of experiment. Because again, I don't know what I want to do. I want to try things out. It's a bad idea. I want to not have to you know, spend hours and hours recompiling stuff. I want to be able to turn off in a few seconds and say, that was really a stupid thing to do. Uh, now, sort of the analogy I like to use when I talk about the, the sort of asynchronous microservices is sort of this model I call RIP Rapid Service Pond. It basically, uh, again, this is a picture I drew of my iPad one time flying across the country. It's not with my fingers, so I do not apologize for the artwork. This is good for me. Well, one of the important things is, you know, basically you want to put an event bus in place. So we're not going to have some, some little MySQL database that has all my information in it in a centralized place. I'm going to have a centralized event bus. And that's going to be my, quote, data record at some level. That's where all the interesting things are going. So the services don't know about each other. All they know about is the event bus. They do something interesting, they tell the event bus about it. Maybe somebody cares, maybe somebody doesn't. Not my problem. That's that loosely coupled. Uh, so I have Rapids Rivers is actually the concept of taking a subset of these messages and putting them together for use of a service. That makes sense. And a name of a pond is basically some sort of static representation. Yes, I need to know exactly what's going on. So perhaps if I'm doing this in a commercial environment, the pond would be your entities. It would be the things that says, here's my email address for my client. Here's his phone number. Here's his name. Uh, here's how long he's been a client. That's sort of static information. But the fact that his email address is changing all the time is a series of events on the rapids. This is the latest one. It's just going into the pond. Again, static. So that's kind of the analogy I'm trying to run. But the key is it's an event bus, not an operational database. And when you have this sort of pattern, you can begin to build some very interesting sort of things. And this is called the need pattern. Uh, the idea is a service will somehow announce to the bus that it needs something. 
And so it says, I have a need. Maybe I want to know if I should loan you money. And I ask that question. And I'll, maybe lots of people are listening to this question. Maybe not. I have to worry about the case when nobody answers because that's probably the case of a sickness algorithm. So I could have a couple of guys here doing this. And this the blue service may be a person who's looking at your bank account. It says, wow, it stays positive. This is good. That's the regular deposit. Probably have a job. So yeah, I think I should loan you money. The green guy may be going off to one of the credit bureaus. But again, these two services don't know about each other. And I may have another service that says, wow, if you go to a university and have a, a postgraduate degree, you're probably a better credit risk. So let me go look up and see if I know that and vote on that basis. Again, independent services don't know about each other. They're kind of voting on what they think should happen. So nice, nicely done. So these guys sort of give their best answer. You accumulate the answer and make a decision. So a very powerful sort of model for doing very fuzzy things. Because, again, I don't know if even if I loan you money, whether you're ever going to pay it back. I just don't know. That's why it's fuzzy. If I could absolutely determine that, I could give you a really great interest rate. But I can't tell. That's why I have a high interest rate. So, again, neat patterns. Different sort of patterns for asynchronous algorithms. The nice thing about this, if I have another idea for a better blue service, I can build that better blue service, deploy it with this blue service still running, and see if I like it. And about, I don't have to tell the first blue service about it. I don't have to tell the green one about it. I don't even have to tell the yellow one about it. Again, independent deployment. Very aggressive, easy to change system. And by the way, if the green guy goes down, I'm still getting answers. Maybe not as good an answers as I get, but I'm still running. I haven't stopped. So a very graceful degradation. Very powerful aspects of these asynchronous algorithms. The nice thing about this sort of system, then, is I can build an incremental application. I can sort of start out with something simple and make it a little smarter the next day. It's more the next day, it's more the day after. You get this really powerful ROI, commercially, because you, between the time you start doing something to get your first result, is very, very, very short. And ROI is about how long do I have to hold on to the money until I start my money back. And being able to build a system like this is powerful. One of the things we did in the workshop is we started building a little system to put some additional ads on the page of an existing website we had. And so we put an event bus in place, and and put a service in there to put a message on the bus and ask for these guys to suggest advertising. It was up and running. In fact, within a couple of hours, we had a system that was up and running. And then we made it smarter by putting more information about this customer. Now we have a better decision to make. You keep doing this day after day, and you keep getting a better and better system. So the powerful thing is, again, incremental application. In my house, I don't want to have to sit there for the next two years and write a system and then turn it on. I want to turn it on now and then start trying to make it better and smarter and better and smarter. Compatible to the, to the need. Again, fuzzy problem. So what technology choices did I make for home? Uh, again, home system. I don't have to be too sophisticated about this. Uh, I decided to use RabbitMQ for my event bus. I could use the Kafka bus, but I don't need all the complexity of Kafka. I don't really need the persistence of Kafka. So RabbitMQ was good enough. Uh, I was going to use JSON. Uh, yeah, there's some better compact JSON stuff, but I want to be able to see what the bits on the wire a little more. And by the way, I'm not having a lot of messages here, so JSON. I would not touch XML. Uh, so it's definitely a JSON sort of system. Um, I'm going to use Docker containers and probably some more, although I may have to switch to Kubernetes now because Kubernetes is getting pretty standard. Um, so I'll use Docker containers and some more. And at some point, although I haven't done it yet, I'll find myself a very lightweight little Linux box. Stick them in some closet somewhere and let them run my system. I'll probably have two of them for reliability and they'll do the same thing all the time. But you know, this is where I run my little Docker and stuff on. So that's kind of my technology stack. You've got to make some architectural decisions as well. One of the key architectural decisions is, is you know, um, about designing just in time. I've been a fan for a long time of just in time design. I don't want any upfront design. And I, when you get to a fuzzy problem, you really can't decide up front. So you want to make sure, that from an architectural perspective, you respect the fact that there's uncertainty. And you make sure you don't have to lock that in. Now, I do believe in architectural principles, but you sort of have to have a, a fundamental idea that I'm working with a certain microservice. That's the fundamental point. So some of these architectural rights are important. I want to try to make as many other decisions on the fly as necessary. In fact, after I started putting this presentation together, I had better ideas about how to work my system. And the next time I spent some significant time at home, I'm going to basically rework it along these new lines. Again, take advantage of the uncertainty. Um, I want to build services that are behavior-oriented. 
So I don't like these concepts of entity services where I'm the guy who under you know knows this and you know this. Because you have to write some service that sucks all that data in and makes a decision. That's sort of a single point of failure. It gets really complicated. I want a little service that do do something on their own. Each service does this little bit of job, very simple, keep it working. You create these sort of choreography of service. You'll see some examples of that in the flow. Um, the idea is basically you, you all these services to make decisions. They see some aspect, they'll make a decision, and they'll publish the decision. They don't worry about who's listening. Just publish your decision, maybe interesting in the future. This is an idea we stole from Google, how Google actually works internally as well. Uh, we're going to get reliability for our ability because I'm going to build messages that basically item post. So if the same message hits you twice, it doesn't impact you. I'll, do, I'll still do the right thing. If I want to ignore it the second time, I'll ignore it the second time. You tell me I want the light to be blue. You tell me make it blue, it's already blue, I'm perfectly okay saying, fine, it's not an error. I accept it. That allows me to put redundancy in my services. I can bring two copies of every service up for, for reliability, and the system will still work. I can bring another version up to work. So again, that principle becomes very important as well. So uh, I need a little, a little bit of framework associated with this, and I run a microservice workshop. Uh, Code for this, by the way, is, is public. It's on Get, my GitHub account. It's pretty easy to find. It's a code we use in the microservice workshop. So I got I got Java versions. I got C sharp versions. I have Ruby versions. Um, and the framework is actually pretty for, straightforward. It's, it models that uh, idea of the African rivers quite easily. This happens to be the Java implementation. By the way, I'm writing it in Ruby. I wouldn't write it in Java. It's crazy, but you know, most of you understand Java, so we'll look at it from that perspective. So what you see here is, uh, first thing I do is I set myself up a, uh, a new service. It's going, to be a, it's going to be hooked to a river. Uh, so it's called a river. Uh, it's going to listen for packets coming off the river. This is where I hook my service into. And then basically I, I, I establish my connection to the rapids. That's the rapid in this case. And that's the place I'm going to be publishing my messages into. And then I go in there and say, well, these are the type of messages I'm interested in. So I basically register what I'm interested in. That's the criteria. I don't want the message. So in this case, I may say I want a message that says I want anything that says that the source is a Philips Hue hub, something coming from the hub. I want that message. If it has, I want to make sure it has the current state, some light number of lights counting, and what the version is of that light service is. So whatever the information is, I can make sure I get that. So basically, if I get a message into my system and it has all those particular traits, I want to process it. And the processing API is basically, and I register then for let's start getting the message. So I'm making you instance of this service, and this service will start coming in. Then basically, I write myself an API here, is part of the interface, is when a packet comes in and meets that criteria, I get invoked to this API. And he's going to give me a connection to the same thing back to if I care to. Um, and the packet I came in with, and if there's any sort of problems with the packet, I get a little message about that as well. So I make my decision based upon that message, what I want to do with it. So that's why I just dropped the code in. So again, with about you know, 15, 20 lines of code, I can have a service that actually hooks to my system. It's pretty easy to handle. All right, so how, does the, how do you use this sort of stuff? Well, first of all, you, you got to hook into this hardware and stuff. So the hardware itself is going to have all sorts of variations. Of course, the hardware will get updated and the new version. So I want to isolate that from the rest of my system. I'll do that with a microservice. Most of these IoT hardware kind of have almost two levels of API. First level is kind of very primitive hardware. It says the lights turn on, lights turn off, whatever. Most of them have a higher level because they want to do more for you. Kind of very dangerous because what they want to do, what I want to do, may not align. So in this case, it's simply called teams, which is sort of a combination of various behaviors. So basically, I put my event bus in place, we're having queue in this place. And I'll build what I call these tier one services, which are just their job is to take primitive hardware and turn it into something interesting to put on the bus. So I will control it through these tier one services. That'll be my interface to the outside world. And as again, the IT hardware changes or I buy a new device, I need to be a tier one service to hook it in. Um, and again, some of the services will be services that listen to the device and publish the results. Some will be things that change the device. Probably two different services because they're doing two different things. Don't try to you know, gang these guys together. Club these things together into multiple services. Separate them out if you possibly can. Make them as small as possible. Uh, I will need occasionally some information about the, the higher level stuff. 
I call those tier two services. But by and large, I want most of my, my concepts of, of tier two stuff, scene stuff, stuff, being things I figure out what I want. So I really don't want to hook to the hardware if I can avoid it. So once in a while, there's some cases I need to hook to the hardware. I can't get to it otherwise. But I want to try to avoid that. I want my uh, aggregation to be what I want, not what they've defined. It. And then you finally have more interesting devices like these guys, which I need to suck things out. Turns out, when you press a button on this device, I only get a scene change. I don't get some primitive signal. So I have to, that's one of those cases where I have to sort of pull for that thing. If you put that button, then I'll have to do that. So occasionally I have to suck that data out. Alright, tier 3 services are services that actually really have more interesting behavior. For example, I'm looking at multiple devices and trying to have a more for instance, I have a, a based upon the time of day, I have a motion sensor. So if I walk toward the bathroom, and it's the middle of the night, I don't want all the lights to come on. I just want really a little bit of light to come on. I'm going to blind myself. And that's kind of writing one of these more complex behaviors. Again, a separate service. Uh, it's very important to know what health is on your system. So one of the first things you write is actually a monitor. Because here's what I'm watching. You have all sorts of monitoring. Uh, including looking at error logs and the like. Uh, if something does go wrong, my system, I probably not, haven't, haven't anticipated. But once something does go wrong, and I figure out what it is, I can usually write code to detect it the next time, quicker. So I call these error detection services. Services that sort of pick that information up. And, you know, once I sort of figure out how to correct this, I can actually make a report to this case that says, if this error happens, this is what I want to do to correct it. So for instance, maybe the view box lost its power, it comes back up, and I'm like, oh, well, how do I, what do I do with this recovery? Well, I want to figure out what my light colors used to be and kick all that back off again. Then I'll write that error recovery as well. So this is sort of my taxonomy of the various services I'm building to make this thing work. Now, it turns out one of the problems you have with this with this view system that kind of irritates me is uh, sort of reflected by this picture. I got a video for this, but it's not terribly interesting. It turns out if you have these nice color lights, so I have a, you know, have a green light on this side, yellow over here, blue up here. If I turn off the light switch, the power, turn it back on again, all the lights go white. It's like white, white, white. When you pick a random color, it's like white. They've completely forgotten what color the lights are. And I'm like, that's irritating. I mean, if I want to turn the light switch back on, I want the blue and the yellow and green, because that's what it was. So I wrote, I wrote a service to handle that for me. This gives an idea of, of, of how we put these together. And one of the things you're going to see here is there's no sort of master service that's sort of controlling everything. There's no orchestration service. What you're seeing is each little service is going to do its part, and we create what I call a choreography. Where the idea is, you know, one of those services is doing this, which looks really stupid by itself until you see the other guy doing this. And so it's kind of like putting together, they actually have interesting behaviors by themselves. So I want to create this concept of choreography. So let me do a little flow diagram of how this works. So I got my event bus, the rabbit in queue. Got my new hardware, nice hard device. And I got this little microservice whose only job is, is to figure out what the new state right now is and tell the network. So it turns out uh, I have to pull to do that. So that's his job. So that's not that new time. I'm pulling the new hardware. Say, hey, by the way, what color are all your lights? Where is the motion detector being triggered right now? Just pick all that stuff back up. So his job is basically you know, pull that hardware and push that information on the bus. And by the way, it turns out if the light is turned off and therefore there's no power to it, I actually get from the new hardware that says, I don't know what this light is. It's missing. Which is interesting information. And so I publish that on the bus as well. It says, I have no idea what this light is. So all that stuff gets published on the bus. His job is done. Not that hard to write that code. If something happens to do hardware in there, API changes, that's all I have to touch. Is that. Now I have another service that says what state the hue should be in. His job is I think I know what color I want you to be. That's his job. And so if he hears something about a light being on the on the bus, it says, oh, by the way, the, the light is blue, and he says, blue, it must be red, you idiot. Then he will publish a message to make it red. So in fact, if the light turns on and it's white now, all of a sudden we discover it again, it's white, it's like white, dude, it's supposed to be blue. So it's going to flicker from white to back to blue. So that's all it takes to make that happen. And again, his whole job is, 
I know what light's supposed to be. If you tell me it's not that, then I'm going to make it good. Easy to write this code. And put, put, put these things together, and now I have persistent light color. Going a little further, um, I want to put scenes together. I have combinations of colors of light. For example, when my favorite sport team is on, it's kind of like they have blue and sort of orange as their colors. I want to go in my entire house be blue and orange. With black texture when scores are happening. So I build myself a service that does that. This is one of these scene level services. So basically at this point he picks up the idea that, you know, I have a little switch that says I want this scene. Of course that switch information goes into hardware, I suck it out of the hardware, and put it onto the bus. So it says, oh by the way, this button got hit. Well, when this button gets hit, this light scene says, whoa, that's my button. So I'll take that button and say, okay, well I know these are the colors that I want you to be, and so I'll those color messages. This guy figures out, well, if you're not that color already, I'm going to make you that color, and off he goes. And by the way, it's now persistent color. Because if it goes off and it's white again, it'll go back to the right color. Job over. Again, this guy looks for a button that says a bunch of colors. That's easy to write. Even in Java. Uh, another thing I want to have is a dashboard. I want to be able to sort of sit here and sort of have a little picture of my flat and what the lights are. I want to sort of see it, even sitting here. And so what I'm doing is I write a little service that does that. Sitting there, and he's basically just listening for all the colors. So these are the lights are on, these lights are off, these are what colors they are. And I build myself a JSON structure to capture that information and push it back to the bus. The job is over. Oh, another guy will pick up that JSON structure and either you know, do a web map or maybe to my iOS device. I haven't written that code yet, but you know the JSON structure is there. It says, here's the current state of all the lights. What do you want to do with this? No, no, but it's not his problem. It's a JSON structure. Here's the current state of the lights. So again, you can see I write these little tiny services. Very easy to work. Begin to get some really sophisticated behaviors in my house. In these microservices. So fun to play with this sort of architecture. So my observations from you know, sort of working in this sort of environment. Uh, there's a lot of messages. I'm pulling all the time, pushing messages out all the time. A lot of these are not going to have any impact. I don't care. One of the things that we do in these systems now, you go ask Netflix how they optimize their overall system. And Netflix, oh my goodness, it's a huge company. they got a huge footprint in, in, the, in the cloud. Uh, they got tons and tons and tons of customers all over the world. What's, what are they going to optimize for? You ask them, the answer is we optimize for programmer productivity. We will spend dollars to be fast. And to some degree, that's my trade-off here. I don't care if I have lots of messages. It makes my job easier. Yes, I can be way more sophisticated in some of these services and save myself a few messages, but why would I do that? I'd rather have new functionality, because this works fine. So let me take advantage of the fact that things are fast. There's tons of capacity. Uh, you notice I don't need any RESTful interfaces. There's no sort of registration of services. These services were independent of each other. I didn't have to go send one message to the other guy back which means I can sort of add services willy-nilly without reconfiguring anybody to worry about them. Very powerful concept as well. Uh, there's no reason I can't bring two copies of every service up. Imagine I have two copies of each one of the services I looked at. The system still works the same. So guess what? If I look at reliability, I look up two Linux boxes, I get two sets of containers, you know, sitting on common rabbit and queues, let them both try to hammer all the lights, perfectly happy. I'm not writing a unit test. Unit test, think about the functionality. It's how hard is it to sort of take a signal in and say, be the six light color? Why would I write a unit test? You think, it's, you think you can't get that right? If you can't get that right, you should not be a programmer. It's not that hard. And if it's wrong, that's we're actually put in place, though, because we're writing really complicated algorithms. We're writing these in these gigantic monoliths. We're afraid we don't understand the system. So if you can't understand the 20 lines of code, again, find yourself another job. So things like unit tests, which are very important for monoliths and spiritual applications, may not make so much sense when you're working in a complex environment. Well, basically, my system has fast failure. So I'm looking for my system to fail and then fix it by, by better services rather than writing acceptance tests before I deploy. So a very strange thing about these sort of microservices, especially asynchronous systems, is unit tests go away except for that's what we saw when we were doing these original microservice systems in London. 
is that we didn't have tests anymore. We went from no books to production systems. No staging servers, no testing servers, no books to production. We were fast. Um, so we took advantage of that as well. So uh, if you sort of look at the processes associated with this, you're going to see some interesting differences between developing these traditional systems that we're familiar with, the agile processes, and these sort of interesting little complexes. So if you look at the XP values, this is one of my favorite lists of things that are really fundamental to every organization that is like go in there and coach organizations and transform organizations. I want to make sure these are all true. And courage is particularly interesting because I read courage as no fear. I'm trying to create a no fear environment. Uh, and so I look for sources of fear and I try to crush those sources of fear. So those are important. And you now if you're working in traditional systems, if you have values, you wind up having these sort of practices. You know, stand up, estimate, iteration, refactorings, and and, uh, and retrospectives and the like. You have these sort of uh, well-defined roles. You have to figure out what you need to do next. And the architect, the developer, the run master can help you run the stand up and the retrospectives. And some key way to make sure it all works and put manage your customer roles. So when working in these complex things, all of a sudden, different set of processes. Of so trying to do things radically. And in my experience in working with these sort of complex problems, you know, this turns out to be the fuzzy practice. They almost all go away. This is why a traditional organization with even great traditional agile practices struggles moving into complex system problems. They're trying to force this stuff into it. In fact, in the roles in particular, all of a sudden these roles go away as well. Uh, you heard me make some presentations several years ago here. I talked about my anarchy. Basically, says to solve these fuzzy problems, what do I need to be? Well, he doesn't know what I need either. Right? He doesn't know what to tell me to do because it's a fuzzy problem. And what do I need an architect for? Because I'm constantly changing the system. That's a sort of implicit role of the developer now. And Scrum Master about process and we're going to do stories. We have a backlog. Doesn't exist either. Don't need that guy. Uh, QA, where we test, what the system has built. I don't do unit tests, only go acceptance tests. So I'm sorry, what does QA do again? Uh, we're basically having a more system. So I need a customer that says, this is what I'm trying to accomplish. And the job of the customer now is not to feed me stories, but to teach me the domain. What's the domain? What are the key performance indicators? What does success mean? Teach me your domain. Oh, my domain is really complicated, he tells me. Excuse me? Have you ever tried closure? You try to deploy an Amazon Cloud, AWS tools. You think your job is more complicated than my job? Really? Don't believe me. We can we can handle the complexity. Just tell us what your job is. Oh, we have a newspaper. I'm sorry. How complicated is that again? You have articles. Whoa, that's tough. Um, so the hungry is developers and, and customers solving this sort of problem. And the customer role is teach me your domain. What's important? Why does it work? How does it work? What does it so here's a case study from a project I worked on in 2006, uh, again, a London company. Um, just sort of showing some of this stuff happening. These were the people in there. Uh, by the way, I'm the, I'm the Fred. This is George. That's not me. I'm the Fred in this case. So we had sort of a traditional sort of team structure. Uh, this is a ThoughtWorks project. We had a manager, a tech lead. We had all these titles. So Dave was actually the official project manager. Uh, George was the tech lead. He was a former Ruby programmer. knew Ruby really well. Um, I was one, just one of the developers, along with George, who was going to write code, and we had a couple other developers as well. Uh, Jeremy was our business analyst. This was our team, and of course, Matt was our customer. Um, so this is what the official titles look like. What was really going on is, it turns out, of course, we were going to test the code ourselves. So Dave, who was a party man, says, I'm going to do the acceptance test. Of course, the customer was doing it as well. So we didn't need a tester, so we had that role covered. Uh, it turns out, in terms of running the team and stuff like that, if I'm in a project, I'm helping run the team. So I'm in the of doing that. I'm interfacing with the client directly about that. It turns out gray hair gives you prestige for some reason. So I got gray hair, so let's take advantage of that. Um, in terms of being a tech lead, yeah, I was actually driving, in fact, a lot of design efforts. I was a UI designer, working with the customer about what he wanted. So I was a UI designer as well. Um, and basically, uh, between Dave and myself and the customer and Jeremy, uh, we did the analysis. We had to build. And in fact, Jeremy realized almost after the first week, he's not important. 
He don't, he don't need it. It's, it. We understand how to do that. The customer understands when we need that. So Jerry rolled himself off the project. So you look at this, it's like, you know, there is no sort of, everybody's kind of doing what they need to do. It goes into a fuzzy problem. So, if you go back to sort of this, you sort of look what Agile stuff is. You got stories, and you have these specialty roles, which make a lot of sense. You have a master, QA, and the like. You have test driven development, you have acceptance tests. And you go, you got migration scripts, so you've got to roll the database back and forth. So, you're playing the fuzzy stuff, a whole different set of things. You want to be focused on future level ideas. It is all about what idea do you have to try to make things work. Uh, we're doing full stack development. What's the most efficient communication between two skills? It's because I, if I know both things, the communication is in my head. It's way more efficient than trying to talk to my other guy. It slows me down. So if I can do both jobs competently, I don't have to be an expert, but I'm competent, I'm faster. We treasure full stack developers. We work in fuzzy systems. Uh, we want systems that fail fast on their own. Uh, microservices is a wonderful technology because of decoupling and how fast you work in that environment. I heavily recommend asynchronous microservices for solving fuzzy problems. If you come to me and says, I have a traditional problem, I want to use microservices, I'm saying, why bother? I, I don't see a competitive advantage for it. But you got a fuzzy problem, don't try it with traditional methodologies. Uh, we use event-based architectures to help decoupling, and we're doing continuous deployment. We're doing this uh, project in uh, this, this system we built in London. We are producing new code of production every three and a half minutes. You go going to production every three and a half minutes. So make the changes that quick. So yes, uh, average average project size with one person, average project length with four hours. We didn't have a lot of planning sessions associated with that, and kickoff meetings and, and backlog, and you know when you're working that way, you work. So that's kind of the story. Of course, more devices are coming. Um, I've actually now ordered myself a thermostat in case I get home. I got that's a motion detector on the new system. And I, I do have to buy my Linux box. Uh, there's also kind of a version of, I want to kind of build Excel for IoT. It turns out there's a really nice model for that out there already. And that's IFTTT. If this and that sort of architecture. Which is kind of an architecture that's pretty easy for every person to describe what they want to behave. What I want to do is take that language and compile it into a microservice. And that's kind of my, one of my challenging projects when I have a little more time on that stuff. So that was quite a nice thing. Of course, security is really important as well because, you know, all these IoT devices are very, very hacked. And all the denial of service attacks are because people are thinking we're massive on these devices. They're not well protected. So in my world, I'm basically going to do a couple things to make that more secure. Uh, first of all, I'm going to, you know, to get into my system, you're going to go through some support authorization. I'm probably going to use the Google authorization. Um, but my RabbitMQ bus is completely internal. Has no external IP address. It's a Docker container with no external IP address. So nobody's going to be hopping on my bus and start sucking things in or putting things in. Uh, and then I'm going to set my own wireless hub only for those IP devices. Which will not have any external IP address. And the only way to get to the external world will be bridge, uh, the bridge microservice that gets me to the outside world with all sorts of authentication. So that's how I'll attack that as well. Um, so I'm going to try to lock it down to make sure I don't get hacked. Um, and what I really want to do, of course, now Docker runs on Raspberry Pi, uh, which is really kind of cool. Uh, so what I really want to do is basically get myself a little stack of, uh, you know, of Raspberry Pis, and this has become my hub. And I want to go to my friend in California and point out, that's my size, how big is your rack? You know? That's my rack, and it does the same thing your rack does. So, um, yeah, it's, I think it's very This is a, just a change in technology in just five or ten years. That could be very powerful. That's my story. Thank you. You know, I've over, I've talked too much, so but I will be around today and tomorrow. So find me if you want to you know, understand more of this thing. So thank you again. <laughs>